Okay. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and I'm happy to share that we actually do some quantum machine learning research here at Wigner. And uh, the, uh, yeah, the title is Problem Informed Graphical Quantum Generative Learning, which is a mouthful, but I will try to, to break it down. And to start from the end, what I mean by generative learning is uh, uh, the task of learning a representation of some unknown probability distribution in order to generate uh, realistic samples. And we are usually given a set of, of training samples. And from those, we want to learn that representation of that, that uh, uh, very complex probability distribution so that we can use that to, to generate pictures, for example, that resemble the training set in any way. Now, since quantum systems are generally or inherently probabilistic, it seems like a natural, a natural uh, machine learning application of, of, uh, of quantum computers to, to do generative learning with them. And this line of thought led to the... Mm -hmm. And we want to use those qubits uh, together with the parametrized quantum circuit to learn uh, a probability distribution over uh, binary random variables. And so, okay, these, these are paradigmatic quantum generative models that naturally inherit the Born rule so that we can use them to generate these, these uh, discrete distributions. And this is, of course, uh, quantum machine learning with classical data. Now, okay, to, to jump in, what are these quantum circuit born machines? Well, the general task they want to solve is to learn a representation of a target probability distribution over binary random variables. And we either have explicit access to the target distribution, which is of course not very realistic, or we have access to a limited number of training samples and we want to generalize uh, based on them. And if we want to translate uh, this task into the language of quantum circuits, then we can say that we want to learn a, a quantum state by optimizing the parameters of a variational quantum circuit in uh, such that if we measure that final quantum state in the computational basis, we get samples from a prob probability distribution that the epsilon close to, to the target distribution that we wanted to learn. And how we can train these models we, we uh, apply all these parameterized layers of unitaries to our quantum state, then we measure in the computational basis, calculate the mismatch between uh, the training set and our samples, and then update the parameters based on some gradient-based or gradient-free uh, uh, training scheme. Now, in general, these born machines use a, a general purpose ANSATS, which are, are very powerful in the sense that they are expressive, they can reach wide corners of the Hilbert space, but they face several challenges which are connected to their trainability, like barren plateaus, so places in the lost landscape where the gradients vanish exponentially, or poor local minima from which you cannot get out of. But we can see these all these things as a consequence of the no Lange theorem, which naturally translates to, to quantum machine learning which basically states that uh, these general purpose uh, models will have a poor average performance. So the bottom line is that there is no one model to rule them all. So what we can do or how we can see this problem, we can see this as a lack of sufficient inductive bias that is encoded into, into the quantum circuit, into the ansatz. Now, the question is how we can incorporate problem-specific knowledge in these very general, uh, general uh, distribution learning tasks. And we answer this question by using probabilistic graphical models. So if we know some independence relations or conditional independence relations between our random variables that we can represent as a graph, we use that graph to encode this, this problem-specific knowledge into the ansatz into the quantum circuit. So the general framework would be something like uh, starting from a generative learning problem, 
we represent uh, the structure of the problem using uh, a probabilistic graphical models such as Bayesian networks or Markov networks, and we use that same graph to, to construct the ansatz. But then what are these probabilistic graphical models? Well, most of you probably know Bayesian networks, but Markov networks are less known and we will concentrate on those, which are slightly more general in the sense that we have a, a general undirected graph to represent a set of independencies that also induce the factorization of the joint probability distribution. But how is this done? If we have a graph, we consider its clicks, and we assign to each click a factor, which, which can be seen as a table, basically where we assign a real number to, to each of the state of, of that uh, set of, of random uh, variables. And if we have these two factor tables, then we can calculate the global state by multiplying um, the, or the probability of, of a global state by multiplying the corresponding rows of, of those two tables. And then we, of course, need to normalize by the, by, the, by the partition function. And this normalization is what makes learning in this framework so hard because it ultimately couples all the variables among the network so that we cannot estimate the parameters locally. We need to deal with the whole network all at once. Now, how do we use these, these uh, uh, sort of graphs? If we have that uh, Markov network representation with the click structure, we constructed a uh, um, many body uh, Ising Hamiltonian, which respects the click, stru click structure of that graph. And after some reparameterization, we implement the time evolution under this, this uh, Hamiltonian. By, well, first we start uh, by some Hadamard gaze to transform our O0 state to the plus state. Then we apply this, this uh, uh, parameterized unitary. And then before the measurements, we uh, also do some general uh, U3 gates on, on all qubits. And this general structure is very similar to quantum circuit Isingborn machines. But in this, this previous design, uh, it was uh, all problem agnostic in the sense that they considered all two local interactions between the qubits, but no higher order ones. And also, it, they didn't take into account the structure of the, of the problem of interest. Now, just to look at a simple example, going back to that four node graph where we have two clicks, the corresponding Hamiltonian can be written in this form where we have three, two, and one body terms. And each of these, the exponential of each of these terms can be implemented with a linear number of C naught gates and a single one qubit rotation gate. And so the, the final UZ operator would take this, this form where those are the two clicks. Now, this framework is very general. Uh, we can, it can, where Markov networks in general can represent any probability distribution. So why, when are these actually useful to construct a quantum learning model? And I will try to answer this in four points or sort of uh, do some explorations into different directions. But first of all, we can ask the question, when does it out outperform problem agnostic models? And uh, for this, we conducted some numerics by looking at these uh, nine node graphs with some grid-like topology. And what we saw is that as we increase the complexity of the problem by having uh, bigger clicks, uh, the performance of the problem agnostic model is worse and worse. But so our, uh, our model, which is the, the blue line, the blue line, both of these lines, uh, um, is, is actually the same uh, because it, it, uh, it also increases its complexity as the problem complexity increases. And also what I should say that even if we don't have a, a performance enhancement compared to problem agnostic ones, we actually have much less parameters, which is also desirable when we want quantum circuits. Now, as a second question, what problems should we consider? For instance, if we have a complete graphs, if we have a complete graph with maximal click factorization, that's also that, that's only one click basically. So we have we have to store every the probability of each uh, basis state of, of that whole thing. So we have an exponential number of degrees of freedom. 
And can, now, can this be trainable? Can this quantum model be trainable? And we see that it cannot be because is the number of qubits, the, the uh, loss uh, concentrates exponentially. So, so we have this, this exponential decay, which also indicates the deterministic uh, presence of barren plateaus, which is quite bad. So these are not uh, optimal for sure. But if we consider Markov networks with a polynomial number of parameters, which are still classically hard, then we get a better trainability. We have something closer to a polynomial um, uh, decay, which is, which is it, it doesn't uh, uh, prove the absence of barren plateaus, but it's, it's much better trainability. And we call in the paper, we call these sort of networks efficient uh, representations. Now, as a third question, I wanted to ask if we can learn Markov networks with a Bayesian network-based quantum model. And uh, there were several excellent works on, on uh, Bayesian quantum circuits, which are um, a class of, of parameterized quantum circuits on to uh, the Bayesian network structure of a, of a problem. And they are constructed in such a way that if you measure in the computational basis, you get the probability distribution exactly. But also, if you do some basis enhancements, so you don't measure in the computational basis, but any local basis, then you get a model that is more expressive than the corresponding Bayesian network. So this can also be seen as a, uh, a quantum advantage uh, thing. But now, if we want to learn a Markov network with this sort of model, two setbacks. First of all, we need to triangulate the, the undirected graph first in order to convert it to a Bayesian network. And this can be very computationally intensive, like a classical preprocessing uh, step. But also, uh, the, the corresponding Bayesian network might have a much larger number of parameters, and it can also lead much deeper circuits, which are also undesirable. And uh, here we also looked at some numerics with these loop-like uh, graphs. And what we can see that is the same performance with both models, but in our case, we need a much uh, shallower circuits, uh, which, is, which is of course desirable. And as a, as a last sort of insight, uh, we wanted to look at the potential for a quantum advantage because this would be the, the ultimate goal, I would say. And in the, in the case of generative learning, this can have basically two, two uh, flavors. It can either be learning advantage, in which case we get better accuracy, uh, less learning steps needed, or, or a, a lower sample complexity. And then this would be a learning advantage, or we can have a sampling advantage. And by this, I mean to the fact, I mean the fact that if we assume that our problem is learnable by both a classical and the quantum model, we can more efficiently sample that trained quantum model than the corresponding classical one. And this would also be an advantage. And in, in this case, we argue in, in the, the paper that we have some potential in this direction because the class of probability distributions that are efficiently represented by our class of quantum circuits also contain the class of QAOA circuits. And for those circuits, it was shown that they are on average hard to classically sample. So those, are, those contain uh, many hard cases, but also Markov networks are hard in general. So the overlap of these two uh, classes can lead to a demonstration of, of quantum advantage. So just to recap, uh, we have seen that we might need to consider higher order correlations between the random variables to outperform problem agnostic models. If we have a polynomial number of parameters, then we have better trainability. If we have a graph that is hard to convert to a Bayesian network, then we have a, a more cost-effective uh, quantum model than Bayesian quantum circuits. And if we consider probability distributions that are hard to sample classically, then we have a potential for quantum advantage in sampling. And just to show, we, we recently put out the, the uh, preprint to, on, on archive, and you can also see my collaborators here. And I, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. So 
it was an excellent talk and very, very nicely presented this hot topic. Time for questions. Thanks, very, very nice. Um, it's, it's kind of a detailed question. In all the plots you showed uh, yes. for a performance, uh, you showed two sets, this and the previous one, right? The, um, not, yes. yes. How do you explain the change in behavior between the KL and the MMD losses? Yes. It gets hard. I mean, I would expect that when you have a harder problem, the MMD would work best, but it doesn't. Yes. So, so yeah, it, there are a, a few more differences in, in between those two cases because, of course, the, the loss function differs, but also for the KL divergence, uh, we assume that it has access to the exact probability distribution yes. that it wants to to uh, approximate, and in the case of the maximum dis mean discrepancy, we only consider the limited number of training samples, which was also quite low, like 1,000 or 10,000 okay. samples, and it wanted to generalize based on those. Okay, so it's the way you calculate MMD. That's yes, right. yes, okay. yes, yes. And you didn't try to extend the, what's it called, the, the parameters, the... Ah, the variance of your MMD of the kernels. So oh, you didn't we, try we, to play with yeah, the MMD. We, we considered uh, three Gaussian kernels and we took the average of those. And, but but yeah, I haven't position. tried uh, like other types of kernels, okay. basically. Because then you have the other uh, curves, yes. the other, and it goes the other way around. Yes, it, <laughs> it, it varies, sort of. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly the reason why. Uh, in certain cases, one is better than the other, and in other cases. Okay, better. but it would be interesting to. Yes, yes, that. I agree. I agree. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, further questions from the audience. <clears throat> I cannot see. <laughs> Sophia, maybe have some further questions. <laughs> no, no. Okay, I would have a question uh, which is related for the technical details. So, for this uh, calculation, you are using the same machine, the the Maxeller accelerator cards, yeah? Or this is running on GPUs or the? Well, the fact is that uh, these graphs are quite small, so at most ten qubits, mm -hmm. and in those cases we actually have a uh, worse uh, simulation time on GPUs. Like uh, the GPUs start, mm -hmm. to start to kick in above 20 qubits maybe. Mm -hmm. So for these small examples, it's better to, to run them on CPU basically. Yeah, so it's simple C CPU. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay. I tried bigger instances with, with GPUs, but then I, then I saw that, yeah, we need quite, quite big circuits to, mm -hmm. to have an enhancement there. Okay, further things? Yeah, please. We, we we have time. It was very much on time. So so, so uh, the, the the other question I have maybe maybe it's uh, so all of this is simulated, correct? Yes, yes. Now I, I I would think that if you if you were to target your simulation to some specific hardware, then the choice of the let's say the topology on the hardware would have a very big impact. Yes. Can you simulate this? Are you looking into what would be, for example, a realistic setup for running on full topology like ions? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what, what would differ here would be the, the, the gates and the depth of the final circuit that yeah. is compiled to the, that uh, topology, right? And then we would need noisy simulations to actually see the effects of those, right? Okay. Yeah, well. Can you do that? But do you? I mean, well, I, I haven't done it, but, but it can certainly be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nice. Thank you. Okay, any further remarks or questions? I cannot see any raised hands, so let's thank Ben again. And move to the next speaker, who is Daniel Nagy. Uh, Daniel Nagy, and he will speak about the hybrid uh, quantum classical reinforcement learning in latent observational spaces.